The following risk assessment training comes from our successful program developed for university research labs. Nevertheless, this training is suitable for anyone who would benefit from risk assessment training. This training provides the tools to recognize hazards and aids in the creation of an enduring safety culture, something best achieved by winning hearts and minds. Hence, we set about making a compelling case for the risk assessment process. We achieve this with the aid of NASA and the story of Apollo 1. The viewer finds themselves drawn into an interesting historical narrative in which the risk assessment process is demonstrated. We now ask you to sit back and watch the story unfold. As you do, we suggest you carefully consider the following. What could be the subtle sign something is wrong? Why is it so difficult for people to speak up? Why do we lack the imagination to recognize the risk? How can we overcome these hesitancies and call out all the hazards? This story begins in 1967. The first Apollo spacecraft is ready for testing and the first crew has been selected. The commander will be Gus Grissom, 40. Six years earlier, Grissom was the second American in space. The senior pilot is Ed White, 36. A few years ago, he was the first American to spacewalk. The pilot will be Roger Chafee, 31. This is to be Chaffee's first time in space. On the launch pad, the Saturn V stood at over 100 meters. Up until now billions of dollars had been spent on the US space program, yet the Russians continued to dominate the space race. NASA was therefore under enormous pressure to be first on the moon and do it before 1970. The crew occupied a six cubic meter capsule at the tip. Along with the crew, the capsule contained the world's first microcomputer. January 27th was a Friday. Launch was scheduled in three weeks and everyone involved was working long hours testing every system. As the launch schedule had already been delayed several times due to the ever-mounting technical issues, everyone was under immense pressure. By this time the morale of the crew had hit rock bottom, as many around them were noticing. Grissom in particular had expressed his grave concerns on many occasions. He had discussed his concerns with many of his colleagues and expressed his general disdain by hanging a lemon on the simulation equipment. However, competition between the astronauts was intense and Grissom was well aware that rocking the boat could well cost him his position and he had been promised the first moon walk. Nonetheless when the capsule was finally certified as complete, the crew posed for this jest photo, presenting it to NASA management. Is it possible this was a thinly veiled plea for help? The fully suited crew entered the capsule just after midday to run through the last of the test procedures. The capsule sat on top of an unfueled rocket. However, to simulate launch conditions, the capsule door was sealed and pressurized with 100% oxygen. Once this test was complete, everyone could enjoy a well-deserved weekend. Nevertheless, the Saturn V was the most complex machine ever built and with every passing hour unresolved technical issues continued to mount. So, without any progress being made, Friday afternoon soon became early evening. By about 6.30 p.m., Grissom could no longer contain his frustration. In response to never-ending communication issues, Grissom was then heard to say, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two buildings? As the controllers had not understood the message over the radio static, an increasingly frustrated Grissom then repeated, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings? Soon after the instruments recorded an electrical surge. Amongst all the other technical issues, no one was concerned. This was later believed to be a short circuit, somewhere in the 50 kilometers of capsule wire. The dangers of working in 100% oxygen were well known by NASA and the aviation industry. Oxygen causes combustible materials to become highly flammable. All that was required was a spark and the nylon, velcro, and any other materials in the capsule would burn explosively. As oxygen is a major component of all rocket fuel, this would have been obvious to rocket scientists. At 6.31 p.m., the crew could be heard reporting a fire within the spacecraft. Initially their voices were calm, but soon the NASA headsets would echo with their chilling screams. 
Within 15 seconds the heat and pressure had become so immense the capsule split open. Autopsies later revealed the three astronauts had died within 15 seconds of the first mention of fire. Later that night, three young families were to learn their fathers were to never come home. A congressional committee was convened to investigate the circumstances of the Apollo 1 accident. Twelve months later the committee found the accident was the result of many technical faults, including poor capsule hatch design, poor wiring, the use of combustible materials, and the use of 100% oxygen. However, the most critical finding of the 1968 report was revealed by a single line contained within the conclusion. There appears to be no adequate explanation for the failure to recognize the test being conducted at the time of the accident as hazardous. This was a clue to a culture that wasn't addressed for over 35 years. A culture that ignored unacceptable risk and silenced any dissenting voice. This organizational groupthink would go on to be major factors in the 1986 Challenger and the 2003 Columbia disasters. Within NASA this is known as Go Fever. Nevertheless, this condition isn't restricted to the space industry and is something we are all guilty of. The symptoms of Go Fever often present is the following. The fear of failure is stronger than the fear of harm. Unacceptable risk is either ignored or minimized in favor of expedience. Although always given the necessary lip service, safety is generally considered an unnecessary delay or expense. Physical and psychological stress, resulting in very poor morale. So, what can be done to prevent this condition? A good clue comes from astronaut Frank Borman, who was chosen by NASA to lead the investigation team. Borman concluded the fire was the result of a failure of imagination. As the rocket wasn't fueled and oxygen had not caused any issues in the past, NASA had been lulled into a false sense of security. It was because of this that the test being conducted wasn't deemed as hazardous. Hence, no precautions had been made. Recognizing this, what could have been used to prompt the imagination of the many people involved? How about a comprehensive checklist? These days there is such a procedure. It's called a risk assessment. Let's try a very rudimentary risk assessment on the Apollo 1 situation to see what it would have revealed. Could anyone become entrapped or entangled? Yes. As the hatch could not be quickly opened, the risk of entrapment was unacceptable. Could anyone's body be sheared, cut, stabbed or punctured? No, this risk appears low. Could anyone be crushed or struck? No. This hazard is also low risk. Could anyone be harmed by electrical hazards? Yes. Due to the many technical issues being experienced, a short circuit was highly likely. In the presence of oxygen, this could ignite combustible materials. The risk from electrical hazards was therefore unacceptable. Is there an absence of emergency shutoff and or energy release systems? An emergency shutoff system was available, however there was no system to quickly vent capsule pressure. Because of this, the risk remained unacceptable. Could anyone be suffocated? Yes, as any smoke or fumes would be directed into the crew's pressurized suits. This risk should have been seen as unacceptable, as this was what actually killed the crew. Could anyone be exposed to high temperature, fire, or explosion? Yes. As 100% oxygen lowers the flashpoint of combustible materials, all that was required was a spark to initiate an explosion. Due to the many and ongoing technical difficulties, the risk from fire was unacceptable. Could anyone be subjected to thermal extremes? Yes. The pressure suits were not fire-resistant and would not protect the crew from a flash fire. As the crew all suffered third-degree burns, this risk was unacceptable. Could anyone be harmed by pressurized fluids or gas? Yes. The presence of pressurized 100% oxygen causes combustible materials to become highly flammable. The risk from pressurized gas should have been deemed as unacceptable. Could anyone be harmed by radiation? No. As this was only a pad test, the risk of radiation was low.
Could anyone be harmed by chemicals? No. As the rocket wasn't fueled, the risk was low. Could anyone be subject to physical or psychological stress? Yes. Personnel were working long hours and were highly stressed. At the time of the accident, the crew had been tightly confined for over five hours. Therefore, the risk from both physical and psychological stress were unacceptable. So, you can see by applying a rudimentary 12-point checklist, we were able to find eight areas of unacceptable risk. Naturally, this is much easier with the benefit of hindsight. However, considering there were hundreds, if not thousands of scientists on NASA's payroll, would it be unreasonable that just one or two points from this list should have been glaringly obvious to some, if not all those present? Yet they all remained silent. Why? This issue was made plain a few days after the accident by this speech to his staff by NASA Flight Director Gene Kranz. Somewhere, somehow, we screwed up. Whatever it was, we should have caught it. We were too gung-ho about the schedule. Every element of the program was in trouble and so were we. Not one of us stood up and said, damn it, stop. Some may believe the eight points of unacceptable risk would not have been identified, simply because controlling these hazards were beyond the technology of the day. Yet within two years all the risks listed were successfully resolved. Thus, based on the standards of the time, the risks listed were all preventable, hence unacceptable. In conclusion, there appears to be no adequate explanation for the tragedy of Apollo 1, other than the groupthink condition commonly referred to as Go Fever. We feel it when the enormity of a task, and the consequences of failure, prevents us from adequately evaluating the hazards. The physical and psychological stress often manifests as rushing, carelessness, and complacency. Our best defense is to recognize everyone is susceptible to go fever, and that it is best limited with targeted training and a well-formulated checklist, as was demonstrated in this presentation.